that doesn't get you moving this morning, I know what will. Hopefully, I saw some of y'all just kind of like, ooh, what do I do with this song? <laughs> what do I do here? Do I sing it? Do I stand up, jump around? You know, listen, if you're praising God, it doesn't really matter, does it? God wants to hear those praises, and uh, thank God we can open up in a, in a way like that. And, and uh, I'm just so excited today to be able to stand in front of here and, and in front of you all and be able to share a word with you. And we finished up a, a pretty, I thought it was a pretty uh, good series last week where we talked about building those families, building each one of our families so that we can have a foundation to be able to build his church. Amen. That is what we're called to do is to build his kingdom, to go and make disciples of the nation. And today, we are going to start a series. And this is something that uh, I, I, I was speaking with my wife about a, a while ago, and I said, you know, what is something that people tend to struggle with when it comes to our faith? Well, there's a lot of that, right? I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of avenues that we can go down. But I think one that we all tend to struggle with is to actually be able to become a, a true witness to those in the world. And when we are witnessing, we have to understand that each person that we witness to, each person that we come in contact with each and every day is different. They are not you, they are not I. And the problem is, is that we want a world of me, don't we? We want everybody to agree with me. We want everybody to say, oh look, He's the perfect person, or that's the perfect woman, whatever it is, because, hey, they're just like me, right? There are some issues with that, isn't there? There are some definite issues. Well, there is a, a grocer, uh, you know, a man owned a grocery store, and he put up a sign that read, eggplants, 25 cents each, or three for a dollar. Three for a dollar. You ever go into a grocery store, and you see one of those signs, and you have to double check it and, and look at it and say, wait a second, there's something wrong with that. And then sometimes it's in your favor, other times it's not. But when it's in your favor, oh, listen, let me tell you, you're going to be the first one to the register to try to check that thing out, aren't you? But people had issue with this. All day long, customers, they were complaining about it. They said, are you serious? I should get four for a dollar. Four for a dollar. Now, he, he saw their outrage and what he did, though, is he, he packaged four eggplants together. He did not change the sign. Now, the tailor, uh, whose shop was next door, he'd been watching as, as uh, people were going in and out. And he finally asked this man, he said, aren't you going to fix the mistake on your sign? The grocer said, he said, what mistake? Before I put up that sign, nobody ever bought more than one eggplant. It's all in how things are perceived, isn't it? It's all in the way that we share, the way that we, we tell people about what's going on. What's the deal? What's the deal? Now, sometimes you can sell, and uh, it, can, it can depend on how you say it as to whether or not you're going to sell something. And over the next few weeks, we are going to be taking this time, and we're going to talk about witnessing, and, and we're going to be using examples that we find out of the book of Acts, to actually help us understand how we're supposed to witness to others in God's way. And, and the book of Acts, of course, we know that that is really the beginning of the church. That's where, where the church truly got, it, got its, its start. But we're going to be talking about a few different ways that we can witness. So we're going to talk about, and these are going to pop up on the screen, witnessing to people who are actively seeking Christ. And your senator saying, oh, those are the easy ones, right? Okay, well, that'll be next week. Witnessing to people who are hurting. And what about witnessing to people who, act, who actively oppose us? That's the fun one. But today, we are going to talk about witnessing to people who are religious. Is that going to pop up? There we go. People who are religious. So that's a term that's thrown around very vaguely, isn't it? I'm religious. You ever have somebody tell you that they're religious? Okay. There are all kinds of religious people in our town, and some are very committed to their church. Uh, others may belong to a church, but they're not so committed to it. You know, they don't mind missing here or there. And, and still others don't go to church at all, but you know what? They still consider themselves religious. So let's talk about that. In 2008, there was a researcher, and his name was David Olson. 
And I love bringing these numbers into there. And this is back in 2008. Now, I, this is one that was really good, and I haven't found some more up-to-date ones. But listen, 2008, I'm going to tell you, the numbers that I'm given now, we could probably say that they're going to be greater or worse, depending on what we're bringing up here. So let's talk about these. You came to the conclusion that only about 80% of Americans, uh, about 80% of Americans do not regularly attend church anywhere. I will tell you, I will tell you, mo it's more like 50% now. It's almost halfway down the line. And of that 80%, though, let's look at this. A vast majority have been to church at some point in their lives, and they may have gone as a child, or they may have gone as an adult, or maybe they've drifted away from a church, but they went, or they had a bad experience at church. Now, a survey by, by Lifeway Research, they found that the formerly churched people, these are the formerly churched people, and they found these numbers. They said that 28% say they are presently unlikely to consider regularly attending church. Now, these are of people who are what we like to call de-churched, okay? De-churched, not unchurched, but de-churched. They've, they've removed themselves from the church. 28% say they are unlikely to even consider going back. 58% feel it's time to return to the church. Okay, so that's, that's good. 41% said they'd go if a friend or an acquaintance invited them. And 35% said they would return if they knew that they were, there were people there like them. Nearly a third, though, listen to this, a third feel God is calling them to attend a church. A third, so 31%. Now, my point through all this is that there's a vast number of people who are out there who are just waiting to be invited to go to church. A vast number. And just like that grocer who learned to sell eggplants, more eggplants than he normally did, even though it was kind of an odd way, but listen, he was able to do it by saying the right thing at the right time. Now, let's take a look at how Paul witnessed to some religious people down by the riverside. Isn't that a song? Down by the river, okay? So notice, I want you to notice in, in, the, in this text, there's something you'll, you might be able to pull out of this. And this is found in Acts 16, 13. And it's a woman's prayer group. And what it says is that on the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. Notice, this is a woman's prayer group. All, okay, all women. doesn't mention anything about, about the men. Okay, And I've noticed, by the way, I've noticed that women tend to be a little bit better about meeting than the men do. Am I right on this, men? Ladies, you all have a great time. I love seeing when you, you go to your different trips, uh, when you gather together to play your games. It's so nice. You know what us men do? All right, you said it. I'm not getting in trouble for that one. But listen, men, we do different things, okay? We'll, we'll talk a little bit, okay? But, but here's the thing is that I will say this, and I will admit this wholly. Women are much better about getting together, about meeting, even about praying together. And men are more prone to wanting to do things themselves. Does this sound familiar? And they're less likely to want God's help. Women generally have a more tender heart to, to Christ's love. If I'm saying anything wrong, y'all can throw something at me, but I think I'm right on target on this one. They're probably, th this group is probably mostly Jewish women, and they were gathered for prayer on, on the Sabbath. And now Lydia, she have been a, may, may have been a Gentile that actually met with them. Uh, there's a term that's associated with her, the worshiper of God, and that means a, it's a code word that really means... Gentiles who are attracted to the Jewish love for God and the stories that they found in the Old Testament. But she and the other ladies, they were gathered down by the riverside. We could definitely make a song out of that one, even if there isn't. But why there? Why not in some building or town? Why didn't they not find some great air-conditioned place? Well, okay, that's, that was an issue back then. But why by the riverside? How many, I, I will tell you this. For me, some of the best time in worship and prayer that I've spent has not been inside a house. I, I think some of y'all probably admit the same thing. It's being outside 
by some part of nature, this, this, what God has created, and be able to see his creation. And if, that, if you don't look outside here, as you walk out this building and look at these mountains that he has created, if you don't see that and, and believe that there is a creator, I really don't understand. And I, I teach seventh grade science, by the way. So, science is what God created. Okay? Let's talk about this, too. There's no, probably no synagogue in town. That was one of the issues. And according to Jewish tradition, a, a synagogue could actually only be formed if there were ten men that actually helped to form that group. Now, as you may notice, though, in this reading, we, there are no men around or down by the river, or, or it was just all women. So here's Paul, and he's witnessing to, to a group of religious women down by the riverside. There's that. I, I'm going to make a song out of that. If there is not one. But he doesn't, <laughs> that's why I'm sure there is one. But he doesn't appear to have been overly successful. And let's talk about that. As far as we can tell, only one woman seems to have responded to, to his teaching, and that was Lydia. And how do we know this? Because we read later on in Acts 16, 14, that one of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. Now, that would seem disappointing, wouldn't it? And I'll tell you, as, as a minister, I, I was told very early on, when you go up front and you start speaking to people, do not expect the entire congregation to come forward. It's not going to happen because God has a plan for each one of those people. And you have to understand that when you look at this, that Lydia is really the one who responded out of this. It seems disappointing because here you got Paul and Silas. Listen to this. This doesn't make me feel too bad. Two big-time evangelists, and, and they traveled all the way to Philippi where they, they find this prayer group. And they're willing to listen to them, and only one person is converted. Only one person. Now, granted, her whole family was later baptized into Christ, but Lydia was the only person to have responded to their first effort. But even if she'd been the only person in her family to become a Christian, listen to this, God would have considered that conversion a success. One person. In fact, it appears that God sent Paul to the specific city, to the specific prayer group at this time to, to just for this sp specific woman, because she seems to have formed the backbone of the church that was later established there. Okay, so this was huge. Even though you sit there and say, oh, it's just one person. We had this huge opportunity and I was I had I was on my game and you know I was saying the right things and one person one person and you had to kind of think that later in the chapter though listen to this we find that Paul and Silas are in prison for, for preaching Jesus and in Acts 16 40 we're told that listen to this after Paul and Silas came out of the prison they went to Lydia's house where they met with the brothers and encouraged them. So what this is telling us is this story, there's, there's some, a gap in time here, but at some point, Lydia was converted, but then there was some major growth after that, wasn't there? There was some growth. After being released from prison, Paul and Silas's first destination was Lydia's house. And who was there to meet them? The brothers, the, the men of the church. They were there to meet them. And it appears that Lydia's home had become a meeting place for the church, and it may have been a, a natural location for new Christians to actually gather and worship. So what did Paul say that won Lydia to Christ? What did he say? We don't know. We do not know what Paul said. In fact, uh, not one single word of what Paul said to her is recorded for us. It is not. I could be wrong on that. I always try to double check, but I have not seen it. And probably because... It wasn't Paul's words, listen to this, it wasn't Paul's words that captured her heart. It was not. L look in Acts 16, 14. We're told that the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. So God opened Lydia's heart. And how long had God been working on Lydia's heart? I wonder. 
See, what happens, though, is we, we come here uh, up front, or, or maybe you're talking to somebody and, and trying to talk to them about Jesus, and you are just talking to them till you're ba- like you're banging your head against the wall, don't you? Yes, you know what I'm talking about. And the difficult thing is, you might do that, work on somebody for, for a long time to talk to them, and next thing you know, you just come up to somebody who you barely even know, and you talk about Jesus, and boom, they're converted. And you're like, what did I say? You're trying to remember exactly what you said. Let me write this down. Did anybody record that? Did anybody see that? Okay, because I want to know how I did that. Okay, that's the problem. I. I is the problem. And we're going to get into that a little more. I was actually, uh, well, first of all, I want to talk about this. This is important to understand. Is that we do know that this is exactly what Jesus promised the Holy Spirit would do. In John 16, 8, he says, When he comes, which is the Spirit, it will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. So Jesus has already laid the groundwork for the fact that the Spirit is the one that's going to do the work. I was in sales before entering into ministry. How many of y'all have ever been in sales? In some form, come on, admit it. I know you you have this, like, terrible uh, idea of who salespeople are, right? Okay, but listen. At some point, I will tell you, you were in sales. Did you get a job somewhere? Guess what? You had to sell who you were. So I will tell you that everybody in here at some point should be raising their hand because if you've ever had a job, if you've ever been able to get your way with something, you've been in sales. Yes, you have to admit it now. So here's the thing is that I was in sales, and I will tell you that I knew pretty well over time. It took time. But I knew how to close a deal. And I feel pretty confident in the fact through the sales techniques and, and things that I've learned over time, okay, that I could pro- I can help somebody to make a decision for Christ. Now listen to this though. The problem is this issue of convincing somebody to make a decision. And and you may talk them into get, getting baptized. You may talk them into conversion. You may talk them into, into join the church, whatever it is. But here's the thing is that many times people make a decision that isn't really their own. Yes, this happens very often. There's such a push, such a push to, to force people, in a sense, into a decision that it does not become their own decision. I'm going to tell you about a, this is... Early on when Julie and I and were, were you know, not married too long, and then our kids were little, and we went through this process, and we went through this process of the keeping up with the Joneses. You all know what I'm talking about. We made some bad decisions. We bought a car, didn't like it, went to trade that car in, didn't like that one, and then we had kids. We, and, well, we had kids, but they were getting bigger. So we decided we're going to go to this car dealership, and we were looking specifically for a grocery getter. What is a grocery getter? That is a minivan, yes, okay? That is a minivan. So we go for this, this minivan, and, and there was one we had been looking at for a while, and it was beautiful. It had the fold-down TV, which is hours of entertainment for our kids, and we're like, yes, we don't even have to deal with them on trips. We just pop that thing down and not even have to worry about them, right? Now, y'all know what I'm talking about because there's that thought. So we go in this dealership for this minivan. And we start talking. Well, first of all, as soon as we pull up, I said, here come the sharks. Where are they? Okay. And you start seeing people come out of the woodwork. It's like they're like beating each other up uh, in behind the scenes just to try to get to be the first one to get to you, right? Okay. But they come out, and we walk up. Hey, how are you doing? Just happy as can be, of course. We're, we're excited. We're looking at this, this minivan. Well, we go, and we start looking at the minivan, and he's like, oh, this is great. But let me show you something else before you actually make your decision. So we go, and, and we start looking at this car. Oh, that's really nice. And then this car. Let me just tell you what ended up happening is that Julie and I got talked into buying a Chevy Suburban. <laughs> now, I keep saying we got talked into it because I, I, to this day, I, I swear, I don't even know what happened that night. <laughs> I have no clue. We went in there. And they said, oh, no, no, this is, this is not what you guys need. You need this. This is, look, and at that time, let me just tell you, I, I totally remember how he sold us on it. And you all probably remember this. This was after 9-11. And there was a survival story about 
a group of firefighters, I believe, that were in a suburban, and they said, this thing will withstand any hit. And I'm sitting here thinking, and Julie's over here, safety for kids, you know, and I'm like, yeah, okay. So we both decided we were going to get the suburban. Probably the worst decision of our life. And I'll tell you what happened is afterwards, we had a higher payment. We had things going wrong with it. We just were not happy with that thing at all. But we were stuck because we just got ourselves upside down. You know what I'm talking about. we got to get ourselves upside down in a car. You drive off the lot, guess what? If it's a brand new car, you're upside down. We were way upside down. So we hated that car because of the fact that we felt like we were talked into getting this thing. And we never, ever went back to that dealership. We never talked good about that dealership because we felt like we were coerced into buying that thing. Isn't that funny how we try to blame other people for our own decisions? So here's the thing is that how does this happen, though? They never saw us again. We bought that car. We never came back. People make a decision for Christ. And listen to this. You never see them again. You never see them again. How can this happen? It happens because we rely only upon ourselves to convert somebody. That's what happens. We feel like we are so well-read. We feel like we, we know the word backwards and forwards. Okay, we, we know the Romans road. We know different ways to try to talk to people about it. So we can do this. The problem is, is that we rely upon ourselves to convert somebody. I can talk to them into becoming Christians, which is my job, by the way, and all of ours. I'd convince them of their sin and their need for Jesus. But in John 16, Jesus tells us, he says, that's not my job. That's not my job. And in Acts 16, God is telling us the same thing. It's not all about me and what I can do. So there's a passage out of the Old Testament. And this is so fitting. Psalm 127, uh, first part of 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Listen to that. Unless the Lord builds the house, we are spinning our wheels. It was God who laid the groundwork for, for Lydia's decision. And I think that groundwork had been laid long before Paul and Silas ever got to see her. Some God had been working on her. And in Acts 16, 6 through 7, we find that Paul and Silas, that they tried to go preach in other areas, but they were kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Listen to this. When they came to the border of Mycenae, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So why were they kept from going into certain areas to preach? Because I believe, because it was the fact that God knew that Lydia and others in Philippi, that they were ready. That they were ready to, to listen to, to the story of Jesus, to the gospel. And that Paul and, uh, was directed, and Paul and Silas were directed to that town, to that prayer meeting, to talk to that specific woman at that time, and the Lord opened her heart to the message. So we want to try to plan things out. We want to go ahead and say, well, listen, I want to go here. I love the story that, uh, that uh, Roy was talking about a couple weeks ago. He said he wanted to get into ministry, and somehow, he's like, of all the places, Ghana, right? Ghana. I think you all remember him telling this story. How do you end up in Ghana? The thing is, is that we tend to close the door ourselves when God is trying to speak to us and trying to show us the way. Here's the thing is that the Bible says that we are all all of us are God's witnesses. And the Bible never says that we are called to judge or convict people of their sins. We are witnesses. Now, to give you an, an idea of how this applies, imagine yourself in a courtroom. There's the judge. So, you know, there's, there's the judge, the prosecutor, and the witness. The witness would be on the witness stand. What does the judge do? What is the, he going to do? He is going to be the one that passes what? Judgment. Okay, the judge will pass judgment. What does the prosecutor do? He's going to try to convict men of their wrongdoing. What does a witness do? They witness or they testify about what they know, don't they? 
That's what they do. I'm not called by God to be the one to pass judgment on this world. I'm not called by God to convict non-Christians of their sins. I'm called by God to witness or to testify about what I know about Jesus. Amen? That is what we're called to do. If I do my job, guess what's going to happen? God is going to do his. If that is my job. Another way of looking at it is this. Jesus called us to be fishers of men. And apparently God wants each one of us to do the fishing. And the Spirit of God baits the hook. Think of it that way. Now that brings my next point. Uh, even though we're not told what Paul and Silas said at this prayer meeting, we can be pretty sure that they weren't jumping down the throats of those who believed differently from what they did. Like I said, they were witnesses. They were not there to convict or judge. Many people believe that witnessing is all about being a better arguer. A better arguer. Dave Barry, he once said that, I argue very well. Ask any of my remaining friends. I can win an argument on any topic against any opponent. People know this and steer clear of me at parties. Often, as a sign of their great respect, they don't even invite me. Yes, you know what I'm talking about. Because we all are hard-headed in some way, aren't we? But Paul, he warned Timothy, he said in 2 Timothy 2, 23-25, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. I love it. Well, he just does not pull any punches. Because you know they produce quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct, in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of of the truth. Do not argue. Do not do anything foolish. Foolish arguments. You all have gotten to those. I've done it. Foolish arguments. If you get into an argument with someone, all you end up doing is making them, you know what, a better arguer. You're training them to argue, okay? Most of the time, you're not going to say anything that's going to move them anywhere except deeper into their own convictions. And, the far, and that's going to be farther away from where you want them, from where God wants them. Notice what Paul said after warning Timothy, I'm coming back to this, about not getting into arguments. He said, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. Gently. Paul was telling Timothy to trust God to convict people of their sins. Trust God to convict people. You do the witnessing. And that's what Paul was saying. And God will do the convicting. God is going to work on somebody if you are the witness. You can see this process in the story about another religious man named Apollos. Act, Acts 18, 14, uh, 24 to 26 tells us, Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures, he had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. Okay, listen to this. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. Apollos was preaching about Jesus, but he misunderstood Christian baptism. What was Christian baptism? And before we get into that, I want to mention something here. We have this idea that we need to be sharing the gospel, that need, things need to be done a certain way. And yes, the word tells us. However, how do we approach that when somebody is doing it wrong? How do we approach that? He was preaching about Jesus, but he misunderstood Christian baptism. Peter said that, Christian baptism was not only about repentance, as John's baptism was, but it was also about being baptized. Okay, so there's a little more to it. In Acts 2.38, it says, In the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and when they were baptized, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There was a wrong type of baptism that was going on here. Well, that sounds familiar, too. Listen to that. Okay, two Christians in the area, Priscilla and Aquila, they heard 
Apollos preaching and that they knew he was wrong about baptism, the way it's being done. So how did they respond? How did they deal with this? Did they get angry? Did they stand up in the assembly and challenge him publicly? No, that is totally wrong. That is wrong the way you're doing that. Did they embarrass him in front of his audience? No, they did not. They did not. They took him aside privately. They took him home for cookies and milk. They invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. They took him home, okay? So they did not publicly ridicule. They did not call somebody out in front of other people. They talked to him privately about it. Just like Paul told Timothy, Priscilla and Aquila, they gently instructed him in the hope that God would grant him repentance and lead him to a knowledge of the truth. So they did it gently. And we've got to trust God for some of this. It's not all about us. We're part of the kingdom of God, and we're not some social organization that's uh, like, the, like the Elks or the Lions where uh, we have to just pop, you know, we're so forced to pop that membership up and that kind of thing, okay, to cover bills. We don't look at it that way. This is God's kingdom, so it's vital to remember him in our witnessing. That's what has to happen. It's God's kingdom. It's not mine. It's not yours. It's not ours. It's God's, amen? It's God's kingdom. I'm going to ask again, what did Paul say to Lydia that changed her heart? Like I said, I don't know. We don't know. And my idea comes from another place in Acts where Paul encountered some other religious people. So in Acts 19, Paul encounters some religious people who who lived in Ephesus, and he knows they aren't Christians. Just like Apollos, they only knew the baptism of John. So how did Paul witness to these folks? Well, he asked the question in Acts 19, 1 through 2. He says this, While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So listen to this. A totally different group of people But they also did not understand about baptism, about receiving the Holy Spirit. Okay, So I suspect that Paul knew the answer to his question, though, before he asked it, didn't he? He knew that they didn't know that God had promised to put his spirit inside of believers. But his objective was to take these religious people and ask them a question they didn't know the answer to. Isn't that always fun? In the back, he asked me a question, and you're kind of snickering like, I know it, you don't, you know, that kind of thing. So, ask this question. The question that led him to actually be able to teach them something about Jesus that they did not understand. And that question led them to get getting baptized into Christ and to become children of God. He asked them in Acts 19, 3 to 6, listen to this. Then what baptism did you receive? Look at that. John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So here's the thing. If you're going to witness to religious people, how are we going to do that? And in your your bulletins, there are two fill-in-the-blanks, two ways that we need to focus on. They're very vague, they're very broad. However, these are the ways we can focus on that. First, you and I need to realize the critical importance of getting God involved. And that should be the next slide up on the screen. So the critical importance of getting God involved. If we want God to open people's hearts to us, we want God's spirit to work inside of folks and convict them of their need, then you need to begin praying right now. That means we are turning it over to God. We're saying, Father, I cannot do this. I need you. And Lord, they need you. And Father, I pray right now you will put us in a position, put me in a situation where you can use me. Not that I can do my thing, but where you can use me to the fullest. And that's the biggest part of it, using me. 
I am simply a vessel for God if I have turned over my life to him. Understand that. Second, if you want to please God by witnessing to others, it would help to come up with a question that will get them started on the road to salvation through Jesus. Now, I'm putting some questions up here, too, and you're welcome to look at them. It might be as simple as a question as, would you like to go to church with me? Okay? Would you like to go to church with me? Not always, hey, you're coming to church with me. Okay? That's not necessarily, it depends on the relationship you have with somebody. However, I will tell you, in the approach that you take with that, even if they're your best friend in the whole world, if you force them to go, guess what's going to happen? They may not like it too much. Would you go to church with me? Second, it might be even a harder question like, do you know how to become a Christian? Maybe they're in that place in their life where you can do that. Maybe they're open to hearing it. Might be one of the hardest questions, though. Listen to these questions. Do you ever think about what will happen when you die? Do you believe you go to heaven? Do you want to know for sure? Listen, that is probably one of the hardest questions to ask somebody. Those questions right there. Because you're going to get to the bottom of what they believe very quickly. But it can also bring up a lot of difficult feelings. So you have to be prepared for that. Questions like that, they will open the door for you and it, to be able to introduce them to Jesus and to this church or his church. But when you ask those questions, you need to know the answers yourself. And as the worship team comes forward, I'm going to close up with 1 Peter 3.15. I bet some of you all know that pretty well. 1 Peter 3.15. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Always be prepared. I speak to my kids all the time about that. You need to be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have in Jesus. Be prepared. Maybe the first question, though, for each one of you that you need to ask yourself is this. Do you know the reason for the hope that we have in God? Do you know the reason yourself? And for some of us, maybe we're in different places in our life but maybe you don't truly know the reason why we have hope. The reasons for eternal life beyond this world. And I praise God for that. Eternal life. With those who you love, those who believe, there's an opportunity there. But it's a decision that you make. Nobody's going to make it for you. Nobody can force you to do it. You have to understand that the consequences of not making that decision though, can be eternity in a much worse place. And I'm asking you today, if you have never made a decision for Christ, if you have never said, God, I'm turning over my life to you, I'm accepting your son as my Lord and Savior, and he died and took the weight of sin upon his back, and he took it to the grave, it was buried there with him, and he rose again. Defeated death, which is what he did for us. We too can defeat death and have eternal life up in heaven. But if you have not made that decision, I ask that you consider that today. You're not forced to do anything you don't want to do. This is your own decision. I would also ask if there's those of you in here who have maybe not been that witness that you're called to be. Maybe uh, we, we're one person in here and we go out and we just totally change. Maybe if you're not that witness that we're called to be, we need God's help. We cannot be the person that decides to do it on our own. If you're ready to make that change, guess what? There are other believers in here who can help you with that. We are a body for a reason because we lift each other up. We hold each other accountable. We do what we need to do to make sure we are there for each other at all times. And if you're a believer and you've not joined this body and you're ready to do that, we've had a, a great, last month we had quite a few people join this body, which is so exciting. I ask that you consider that. Consider that you cannot do things on your own on this earth. First of all, we cannot do without God. Second of all, we need others who are believers like us to help us with that process. We can say we can st sit at home and we can be religious and we can watch TV and, and watch sermons, but that is not living the life of a body as we're called to be. So if you're ready to make a change, if you need that, I ask that you consider that.
Please stand as we sing this final song and you take that into consideration.